This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. More on them later in the video. I've done a lot of 3D printing over the years, and I use 3D printing in so many of my projects. I've made everything from small organizer boxes that hold screws, to bigger organizer boxes and organizers that hold special tools. I made bigger things such as this chair with 3D printed pieces. This is fully functional. I've even made an electric scooter that uses a drill. And this thing has a bunch of 3D printed parts in it. I made gears for a functioning vise and 3D printed molds to make these really cool planters. Needless to say, I've done a lot of 3D printing. Probably hundreds of parts, thousands of hours, and this video is about sharing what I've learned during all of this with you guys. So this is my 10 best tips for 3D printing. Now in this video, we're gonna talk mostly about FDM printers. That's the type that uses this type of filament, melts it out of a hot nozzle, and then puts layer upon layer. And the aim of this video is just to give you guys as much information as possible and to share what I've learned. So either you're looking to get into 3D printing or you've been doing 3D printing for a whole bunch of time, I really hope that this video can be useful for you. Now these tips are in no particular order, so let's just start with the first one, which is nozzle size. Now the way all these printers work is that there's a hot nozzle at the bottom here and that is where all the molten plastic comes out. Now there's a hole in that nozzle, which is the nozzle size. Normally, most of these types of printers come with a standard of a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. And my tip is to upgrade that to a bigger one. Currently, on all my printers, I'm printing with a 0.6 millimeter nozzle. That means that the little hole where the plastic comes out is 0.2 millimeter bigger. Might not sound like much, but actually makes a huge difference. Now actually, the surface area of a 0.6 millimeter hole is over twice as big as the one of a 0.4. That means that you can put out a lot more material a lot faster. Now before I show you some examples of how this actually works and how much time you can save, you might think that there's some downside to this. And well, there's only really one downside and that is the outside radius that you'll be able to print, the sharpest outside corner, goes from having a 0.2 millimeter outside radius to 0.3 millimeter outside radius. <laughs> now in my opinion, that's basically nothing and I've never really noticed that that is an issue at all. Generally, all the parts I print are like this or bigger, so 0.1 millimeters is not gonna make any difference. All right, so let's grab our computer. Let's open up a slicer. I'll use the Prusa slicer for this because I'm using a Prusa printer and I'll show you guys how much of a difference this actually makes. All right, so the first project I've loaded up into the program here is just one of these sections for my printed planter molds. By the way, if you're interested in any of the projects that I'm talking about, I'll have them linked up here or you can go and check out my channel for build videos on all these things. All right, so let's look at this part and what actually changes if we change nozzle size. If you keep all the settings the same, nothing really will change because it will do the same amount of lines and use the same amount of infill. The difference that will make is how strong the part is. Because now, all the lines that you're putting down and all the walls will be thicker. And since we're going from a 0.4 to a 0.6, three lines on the 0.4 will give the same thickness wall as the two lines of 0.6. So I think the best way to compare the speed difference is to make everything the same as well as the wall thickness of the finished printed part. So I'm gonna set the amount of outer shells on this model to three. That means on the 0.4 millimeter, it's gonna make three passes all the way around to make a 1.2 millimeter thick wall. In Prusa, you can just come up to print settings and under perimeters, I'm just gonna increase that to three. I'm gonna go over to platter and click slice. All the other settings are the same, 0.2 millimeter layer height and 20% infill. That gives us a printing time of five hours and 24 minutes. Now, if we do the same thing, but switch to a 0.6 millimeter nozzle, but instead this time only use two outer shells because that's all we need to match the thickness of the 0.4. I'll also make sure that the infill is the same so we're not cheating. This infill, by the way, will also be stronger because the lines are thicker. And now that printing time is down to four hours and 20 minutes. That means that we saved an hour on an identical part. All right, moving on to the second tip and that is to use perimeters instead of infill to increase strength. So let's say you want a stronger 3D printed part. Now the slicer will give you a couple of different options to achieve that. The first and most obvious one would be to increase the infill because it is the one setting that is right there next to the layer height. So let's use this same part as an example of how infill affects print time and strength. Now for the sake of this argument, we'll substitute strength for the amount of plastic the printed part will contain when it's finished, just to get an idea of how much plastic is in there and how strong it is. I don't really have any better way of testing that right now. So the example that we just looked at with the 20% infill will take 79 grams. So let's say we wanna increase the strength of our part, we could increase that number to about 50%. 
random number. And our printed part now goes from 79 grams to 121 grams. And you can see here that it's generating a ton of infill. So naturally, that's going to take a really long time to print. In this case, to get our 121 grams, that's going to take us 8 hours and 27 minutes. Now, here's what I'm proposing that you do instead. You increase the number of outer perimeters and keep the infill much lower, making a much thicker outer shell, which I think is gonna give you an overall stronger part. So if you go back to the 20% that we started out as, and then we go to print setting and increase the perimeters to let's say five, which will make really thick outer walls. And you can see now that the outer walls are super thick with just a bit of infill in the middle. That's gonna make 117 grams. So pretty close to the other one. But this one only takes six hours. So yet again, a ton of time saved. Now I actually wanna give you a second example for the same thing because I think it's really important. Now these are the base grids that hold all of these 3D printed boxes in place in my drawers. Since this is a relatively simple and thin 3D printed part and will probably need to withstand quite a lot of abuse over the time, I've chosen to print this solid. So I've increased it to 100% infill. Everything else is the same. I've just got two perimeters like the default says. And you can see from the sliced file here that it will do those two perimeter lines and then it will go back and forth and add a bunch of infill everywhere, which is just gonna take forever. It's gonna take an hour and 36 minutes to print out one of these. Now let's see what happens if we increase the perimeters. For this case, I'm just gonna bump it up to like seven or eight, just to make sure that the whole thing is just gonna be perimeters and there's no small infill lines in there at all. So now the print time goes from one hour and 38 minutes to one hour and 17 minutes. Doesn't sound like much, but if you're printing like 50 of these, that's a whole lot of time. Also, I've tried printing them both ways and the one that does a bunch of small infill lines has a tendency to fail much more often because it's trying to do a bunch of really, really tiny lines right next to each other. Whereas this one will just make one long line for each rectangle. So that's a tip about perimeters. On to the next one. Tip number three, materials. PLA is plenty strong for your project. 99% of everything I print is printed out of PLA. These gears from my mechanical vise that sits on my work table, completely PLA. All the parts for this chair are PLA, and all the parts from my 3D printed scooter are just PLA. So I guess this tip is more for people that are just getting into 3D printing and are worried about all the different materials that are out there and which materials they need to choose. Some are really expensive, some are really hard to print with. I would say stick with PLA. PLA is the easiest to print, is the least harmful in terms of vapors, and it's definitely one of the cheapest ones. Over the years, I've printed a ton of stuff out of PLA, and I've only ever had one part that has failed on me because it was PLA, and that is this part. This is a filament spool holder, and this thing used to live on the back of my Ultimaker inside of a cabinet where it was warm, and it constantly had one of those big spools of filament hanging off of it. After a year, maybe two of use, in heat, this thing failed. It broke up and crumbled away like this. But it took a really long time until that happened. It worked just fine for over a year, and I just printed a new one when it happened. So unless you have a really specific use case or some properties that the material needs to fill for your project, I would highly recommend you just stick to PLA. Tip number four, glue stick. So there's a lot of different 3D printers out there and there's a lot of different print surfaces. And many of these print surfaces tell you that you don't need anything else to be printed right onto them. And yes, in most cases that is true. The only thing they require is to be kept really, really clean. Now I personally use glue stick on all my print surfaces regardless of what material they're made out of. Because it just adds another layer of safety. And yes, I've tried to print a whole bunch on these surfaces and most of the time it's fine as long as you actually keep them clean, but sometimes they come loose. And with glue stick, they basically never come loose. And also just adding a thin layer of glue stick right before it starts printing is in my opinion, a lot faster and easier than having to keep this print surface super clean with alcohol wipes. Also, I don't wash off the glue stick between every print. I just break off the print, Maybe add some more glue stick on top, every print, every other print, something like that. And then once this surface gets to a point where it looks something like this, I'll just wash it off. It takes 10 seconds and I can reapply some more. Only downside with using glue stick over not using it is that the bottom of your 3 printed parts gets a thin layer of glue stick on it, which is water soluble, so it takes five seconds to clean off. So if you're having any sort of issues with the parts not sticking to the surface properly, glue stick is your friend. So here come a couple of tips when it comes to designing parts to be 3D printed. 
Ah, before the next tip, a quick ad from today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators, where you can explore new skills, deepen existing passions, or get lost in creativity. They've got classes on basically everything you've ever wanted to learn. Ideas 3D printing, 3D modeling, woodworking, or video editing. Now, Skillshare is curated specifically for learning. That means that there's no ads, and they're always launching new premium content that means that you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. One class that I'm really interested in is Thomas Frank's class on productivity for creatives. Build a system that brings out your best. I think that's gonna be a really good one. And you better be quick, because the first thousand of my subscribers that click the link in my description below will get one month of Skillshare for free. So you can start exploring your creativity today. Tip five, fill it. Or chamfers. If you don't know, a filler is a rounded corner and a chamfer is an angled corner. The tip here is that if you're adding it to the bottom of the 3D printed part, always use a chamfer. Because 3D printing works by putting one layer on top of the other one, there's sort of a maximum angle that you can print out from the print bed because the line that the printer puts down needs something underneath it that you can print onto. Now that angle happens to be 45 degrees. If you use a chamfer, you can just say that that angle is 45 degrees. And just like with my 3D printed assortment boxes, that angle on the bottom here will be printed just fine. Now, if you add a fillet, that basically means that you're adding a circle. Now with the circle, and I printed a little test piece here, the first few layers in the bottom here will have a really, really big overhang because the bottom of the circle basically starts at a 90 degrees overhang and then works its way up through 45 and to zero, where there's no overhang. That means that the bottom half of a fillet, which is a rounded corner, is always gonna look terrible if it's printed on the bottom of a part. Whereas if you wanna add a fillet on the top of a part, that's totally fine. I do that all the time. Now here's the front fork for my scooter, and this is a good example of how to use chamfers instead of fillets. For instance, the top here is basically two chamfers instead of being a fillet. So this thing printed without supports and the print quality it's pretty good. Same thing goes for the sides. These are chamfers instead of rounded fillets. And even the holes on top here are chamfers instead of rounded fillets, or a hole in this case. So on the bottom of a part, always use a chamfer, never fill it. Tip six, design the parts with the nozzle size in mind. Now that especially goes for the thinner walled parts, like for instance, these boxes. What I mean by that is that you can save a lot on printing time if you ahead of time when designing these, make the wall thickness a multiple of the nozzle size. In my case, when I designed these, I was using an Ultimaker, and on the Ultimaker with a 0.8 millimeter nozzle, it puts down a 0.75 millimeter line. So I made sure to design these with a wall thickness of 1.5 millimeters. That meant that I can print these with only two perimeters and no need for any infill or any thin additional lines in between. Now, if you don't have the luxury of designing the parts yourself, there is actually a way around this where you can tweak the wall thickness just a little bit. And I can show you that using the example of these boxes and the 0.6 millimeter nozzle on this printer. So I've loaded this model into the Prusa slicer. I haven't changed any of the settings. And you can see since the wall thickness doesn't line up with the nozzle size on the Prusa, it is trying to make two perimeters and then this thin infill line in between, which Yes, just adds extra time. Now a quick side note on the 0.6 millimeter nozzle, the line width that the printer is actually trying to print is 0.68. I have no idea why the different printers will try to make different line widths. But here's how you fix that. You can actually go into print settings and then change the default perimeter line width to the one you actually want. In my case, these are designed for 0.75, so that's what I'm gonna set them to. I'm gonna set the perimeters to 0.75, and the external perimeters to 0.75. That should mean that if I come back and slice the model again, we can now see that it's intending to print all the walls with only two perimeters, exactly the way we designed them. And the print time went down to one hour and 15 minutes. So save a little bit of time again. Now it's important to know that you can't push this too much. 0.75 on a 0.6 millimeter nozzle is totally fine. I print that all the time but you can't like increase it to one millimeter or two millimeters and expect everything to be fine. Do a little bit of testing, but if you're really close, this can be a great way to save time. Tip seven, print some test prints before you fully commit. Now, oftentimes I design pretty big parts, at least relatively speaking, like this thing. This is an organizer that is meant to hold all these collets. These have a kind of awkward shape that I wanted to hold perfectly in here. Instead of printing out the whole thing first and committing to 
all this plastic and all this printing time, I decided to print out this little test piece. This is just enough to test the important part, which is the fit between the printed part and the collet. Now this thing takes a fraction of the material and the time to print, and in case there's any changes, you need it really fast, print it again, make sure that everything works, and then print out the full thing. And yes, I did have to print out two or three of these before I got it right, to do that in no time. So you can either print just a section of the part, or if you have really complex parts with a lot of pieces that need to fit together and you want to test multiple things, sometimes I print out the full-sized version, but with a lot less infill and less perimeters. I did that, for instance, with some of the parts from my camera arm, because I wanted to see if everything fit together and if it actually was going to work. Before I committed to the big parts, which each took about two days to print and a full spool of filament. Tip number eight, use off-the-shelf hardware to make your 3D prints a whole lot better. Sometimes it's really fun to model and print threads and have all the functionality be built right into the 3D printed part. But more often than not, when it comes to screws or nuts or ways to hold stuff together, nuts and bolts are just the way to go. And you can use them inside your 3D printed part to make your projects a whole lot more durable. Like for instance, I've made a bunch of these knobs in the past to hold different parts of my project. This is just a hex bolt that is glued into the inside of this 3D printed part, which allows me to get a nice fine pitch metal thread inside of the 3D printed part. And another example of this is stuff like this, where I've 3D modeled a hex hole, which I've inserted a knot into, and that is a great way of inserting metal threads into 3D printed parts super easily. Now we can use regular nuts and bolts to clamp everything together, which both is a whole lot stronger and also more durable over time than these types of plastic 3D printed rods. That same thing not only goes for machine screws, but also wood screws, like for instance, all the parts of this chair, are held together with regular wood screws through the 3D printed plastic parts into the wood, which is really durable. Tip number nine, avoid supports. What I mean by that, try to avoid support structures as much as possible. Support structures are generated by the slicer and printed by your printer to support a section of your part that wouldn't be supported otherwise. Now, I try to avoid them at all costs because they take forever to print, they take a bunch of material, and the surface finish where the support is touched apart is never good. Now there's a couple of clever tips to try and avoid this as much as possible. One I've sort of already showed you and that is to use chamfers instead of fillets on the bottom of parts. If the bottom of this was a big radius, I would have to build support structure from bottom all the way up to hold the top on the inside of this radius. With this one, I don't have to. The stool is another example. Sometimes we can tweak the geometry just a little bit to make sure that nothing of the part has more than a 45 degree overhang. Now normally if you were to print this black part on the printer standing up like this, all of this here would have to be supported because there's no way a printer can just print out in midair like this. But I didn't want all that support structure, so I made this angle in the bottom which allowed to print these pieces at an angle standing up like this. And you can see at that angle, this degree is 45, this is 45, and then it goes 45 degrees that way again. So nothing there needed supports. Now, yes, this is an edge case. It doesn't always work like this, but when you're designing parts specifically to be 3D printed, it is worth trying to spend a little bit more extra time thinking about things like this. Tip number 10. Now in this final tip, I really want to show you that you don't always need to think of 3D printing as the final product because this really nice looking, heavy, definitely not 3D printed part is made using 3D printing. 3D printing can be a great tool to make all sorts of things, like 3D printer molds, like these things. For this project, I've taken three of these that get assembled together with a core in the middle, pour concrete, gesmolite, plaster, whatever you want in here, wait a little bit, take everything apart, and out comes a thing like this that you made, basically only using a 3D printer and some basic casting materials. So if you don't like 3D printing or you're thinking of 3D printing might not be for you because you don't like the plastic look and feel of all these parts that it makes, maybe you want to have one more look at 3D printing because you would never guess that this thing was made using 3D printing. All right guys, that are my 10 best tips and tricks when it comes to 3D printing. Now I would love hearing from you guys if you have any other really cool tips and tricks that you can share with us. And if you do, please let me know in the comments down below. As for now, I really hope you enjoyed watching this video. It's a little bit different from the build videos that I normally do, but I really hope that it can be helpful for a lot of you out there. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye bye. I've got so much stuff. Where do I put all this?